This morning, I, I was awakened by the alarm clock, which is really unusual. Typically, I, I wake up without it. And, but it was one of those mornings when the alarm clock goes off, I was so involved in my dream, it took me a few moments. You ever been there? Where you just feel like you're in this surreal state of affairs and you're, you're all foggy. And, and I was thinking about how we need an alarm clock in life this morning. And that, that alarm clock is when we are mindful of the reality of Jesus' return. Because I can go throughout my life at times, and I guess you can as well, where you don't think about the Lord's return for maybe days, weeks, and who knows how long. And yet God has spoken so often of his return so that we would remember and that we would align our lives in such a way. So I really hope that as we open God's word and, and really look to see in 2 Peter chapter 3, God's heart to help us through the Apostle Peter to remember that the Lord's coming back and then what difference that should make, that there is now a final countdown, the miniseries titled, A Final Countdown, that should affect how we live Monday morning at 8 a.m. And so like that alarm clock this morning, I, I trust this series, that part one, two, and three, will be that for you. For some of us, it's, uh, we, we are Christians, we've been a Christian for a while, but it's uh, the type of Christians you've been there, done that, Christians. It's, it's been a long time since you remember your heart being stirred passionately for the things of God and his return. It's been a long time. So you, some of you this morning, you need to hear that because you've been there, done that, believers. Others of you here, you're routine Ralph and Rita Christians, routine Ralph and Rita's. You got it on autopilot. I can get that way. I'm, even in the midst of ministry, I can find myself an autopilot going through the things that should reflect the reality of Christ in my life. And yet the Lord calls me to wake up, to wake up from that. And then maybe nervous Nellie and Nelsons. Maybe they're, you're here and you're caught up in all the, in the events in the, in, in the news and, and, and all the different events that are happening in our culture. And it just makes you nervous. And you're, you're just nervous Nellie and Nelson. And I just want to encourage you as well that the Lord has some specific words for you. And then lastly, there might be some of you here that based on your proximity, your closeness to the church or the fact that you may be raised in the church, that you think that's close enough. That's your proximity, Paul and Paulina. That you're close enough, but you know, never had the reality of Jesus in your life. And so even most of all, maybe for you this morning, God has some very special words. And so what we're going to do is, is I'm going to go ahead and we're going to, in a few moments, I'm going to have some help. We're going to read the text. But before we do that, I want you to know where we're headed. Because in 2 Peter, written around approximately 69 to 70 AD, is that Peter is writing most likely from Rome imprisonment. And he's writing to the believers to, who are dealing with false teaching. And, and some of this false teaching is around Jesus' return. And he spends a chapter addressing that. He helps them understand the importance of it by addressing three objections that we see in the passage. Three objections that the, the readers, and frankly, you'll, as we go through this, you'll realize that it's not just for 69, 70 AD, but it's for, for you and I as well. And so the, the first objection, again, I want you to know where we're headed. So as we read the text and as we start to unfold it, you have your place in mind. So the, there's objection number one. You know, Jesus ain't coming. It's been way too long. Objection number one, right? Maybe you feel that way. You're like, you know, it's been so long, and, and there's so much has happened. It's been 2,000-some years, and you just feel like Jesus ain't coming. There's a second objection, though, we see in the text. Objection number two. You know, Jesus ain't bringing judgment. God is love. You ever heard that? You ever think that way? That, I mean, really, do we live as if our loved ones without Christ will perish and be separated from God forever? Do we actually live that way? Maybe you can identify with that. But there's a third objection we see in the text. Dude, like, Jesus return ain't thought about. Like, literally irrelevant. Yeah. 
Think about that just for a second. It's how many of us live our lives as if Jesus' return has absolutely zero, makes a zero difference in our lives. It really, frankly, is irrelevant. Think about over the last week or even month, how often have you thought about Jesus' return in a way that it impacted Monday morning at 8 a.m.? So with that, let's all stand together as God's word is read. So would you all stand with me as we read 2 Peter from the New American Standard, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Beloved, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of a reminder to remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, The heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be discovered. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found spotless and blameless by him at peace and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation just as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him wrote to you thank you Yabo. you may have a seat as we go through this passage again I, I trust you can see and identify where you are in the journey. That much like those in the first century, as Peter writes to them, is that we are in places where we just think, well, it's been so long. I mean, really, is it really gonna happen? There's this almost surrealness about when we talk about the Lord's return. And so what I wanna do is I wanna highlight how Peter is inspired by God to respond, again, to that first objection, is that Jesus ain't coming, it's just been way too long. He ain't coming. So look in the text with me, starting in verse 1, he says, stirring up, he says, this, my beloved, the second letter, referring back now to the first letter that was written. Now, this is the second. I am writing to you in which I am stirring you up your sincere mind by the way of reminder that you should remember. Now, the chances are, again, you see this, I'm stirring you up. It means to awaken. There's this awakened intentionality that we are to have as believers this awakened intentionality because we have a tendency to forget. 
we have a tendency to be those who don't remember. So God inspires Peter to say it at least twice very specifically, but you could argue even three times to remember, to be stirred up by way of remembrance. Because of our tendency over time is to forget. Is to be ones that forget what God is doing and will do as in light of his return. So he's saying, I want you to be ones that are stirred up that you should remember, verse three and four. Again, he says, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And I, and I have to really say that there's, this is a reality even today. For those of us who have a little bit of understanding of end time prophecy, which, by the way, over the next week and the following week, we're going to dive right into this with Randy, talking about specifics and the unique world leader. All that will be unfolded over the next couple of weeks. And as I'm teeing that up, as it were, is that what, what God is calling us to do is to realize is that God has been at work. He is at work. And as was prophesied, there'll be times in the future, as is today, they're saying, is Jesus ever going to come back? It's been promised, but where is he? Now, some of you, as you've studied in times, we know one of the critical events was Israel becoming a nation again, coming back into the land in 1948. Just think about that. Unprecedented in history is since 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and sacks Jerusalem, is since 586 B.C. is that Israel's not under its own leadership and power, now, they, they play a very important part in history, and you see all these different armies coming through Israel, almost like a pathway to conquer goes through Israel. And if you would have said to the, before 1948, well, see, what Scripture says is that Israel is going to come back in the land. Well, critics would say, critics, non-believers would say, see, it's been over to, to almost 2,500 years since Jesus, um, there was promises in the scriptures of Israel becoming a nation again, and yet it's been 2,500 years. Come on. Come on. Until what? Until as a result of the Holocaust in World War II, UN gives Israel back the land. So in 1948, what happens? Israel comes back in the land. This countdown, the clock starts again, this, this unique time in history, unprecedented in history. Can we think of any example, for any of you who love history, like myself, is think of any example in history of any civilization who's defeated, decimated, the leadership is spread out, that they maintain their identity for 500 years, let alone 2,500 years. Unprecedented in history, except for those of us who understand and read the scriptures. And so we understand this, the reality of the Lord coming back. And so here, Peter is saying, the mockers are going to rise, and they're going to say, ah, oh, it's been so long, it's, it's not going to happen. Where's the promise of his coming? And I love how God inspires Peter to write this and how he addresses that he, he basically says that God exists outside of time. He says, one day, verse eight, jump down into verse eight. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. So we see that God exists outside of time. When you think of a timeline, like beginning of time and end of time, is that God represents the room. If between my two fingers, is, in two hands is time, from the beginning of time to the end of time as we know it, is God is the whole room here. It's the whole worship center, the whole sanctuary, because he sees it all simultaneously, all at once. And so for God, who exists outside of time, he sees it already done. And a thousand years is like one day, and one day is like a thousand years. And God is right on time, right on time as he is pouring out his grace and mercy that others might come to know and love him. Verse nine, notice the motivation. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing to any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so we see the mercy of God, the grace of God. God is absolutely right on time. And for those of us who are here, who uh, we may have come from Christian homes, we, uh, we may have been ones who have n heard a lot about Jesus, and yet you've never been truly born again, is realize that there is a, maybe a subtle 
feeling in your hearts uh, that you have grasped this delusion that somehow this surreal element to it, somehow that it's going to continue. But frankly, Jesus really, in all practical, if I was really honest with myself, I really don't live as if he's coming back. It's because I genuinely really don't believe it. I mean, I do creedally, you know, like a creed. Yeah, I, Jesus is coming back because I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to say that. Or, but in terms of really believing it, like it has any influence on Monday morning, then I'm a practical agnostic. I can get there, even in ministry. And I have to remind myself, and not surprisingly, Jesus spoke so often of, of his return and calls us here in the text, remember, remember twice. Let me stir up your sincere mind. Sincere is be undivided. I want you to be really focused as if Peter is coming up to each of us and grabbing us by the face and saying, look, focusing it like you're trying to get hold of attention of a toddler, right? And you pull him close and you want to get real close and you say, hey, look, I want you to understand something that remember Jesus is coming back. Remember that. He's calling us to be ones, much like in the first century, to be reminded that it's not going to be a matter of, hey, he ain't coming, it's been it's so long. But no, instead, Jesus is right on time. The countdown has begun. And as we'll, Randy will unpack for us over the next couple of weeks, we'll see just how significant that is. And the events that are happening that I trust that much like these first century believers, we will be stirred up. We will be ones that literally to be stirred up is to be awakened. We'll be awakened from our sleep, as it were, as believers. The second objection is that Jesus ain't bringing judgment. He's a God of love. We might say, yeah, I guess at some level, I believe Jesus is coming back. But really, to judge? I mean, let's think about that. I mean, really, to judge the, those without him? Because notice, again, how God inspires the apostle to respond. Verse 5, but when you... You maintain this, it escapes your notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long and the earth was formed out of water and by water. But notice what he inserts right here. It's this, this aspect of judgment, verse 6, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word and present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of, of ungodly men. So Jesus is coming back and he, he's, there's going to be a time of horrific, terrifying, unmitigated judgment upon those who have never bent the knee to Jesus. And as those of us who know Christ, that this call to be rem reminded of it that is this is the, the, the state of affairs, that we live in a place where judgment's coming. For those of us who live in the coast, let's just imagine that we're all in Malibu for a moment. Can we do that? Can we do that just for a moment? We're all in Malibu. We're, we're a mile from the shore, and all of a sudden, the tidal tsunami alert goes off. Now, I used to live on the coast in North Carolina, and they would have these tidal wave alerts, and the, the sirens would go off periodically once a month. But let's imagine that the, it's, go, it's gone off, and then we look, and all of a sudden, we see the sea racing out. All the water's going out, and we look in the horizon, and there is a mile-high tsunami coming. It's too, you can't run. It's too late. Unless you got a helicopter, you're toast, right? But the alarm has gone off, and, and he's saying that this is the kind of feeling. We know judgment's coming. We know it's coming. And yet, how does that compel me as a believer to live by the grace of God? How does it compel me in my mornings and how I interact with those around me and those who are far from God, for my loved ones who have yet to bend their knee to Jesus? And then for us who have known his mercy, how does that affect us as a missional community at the bridge of God's people? committed to love one another on mission as we seek to take the good news of Christ to a world that desperately needs him, which is currently under the alarm of the horrific tsunami that's headed this way in Jesus' return, right? which will no longer be destroyed by water, but this time fire. And so the call to us is to wake up, is to, to one to be stirred up, to remember, and because many, this will catch, will catch them flat-footed, Again, the motivation, not wishing to any to perish, verse 9, because in verse 10 it says, but in the day of the Lord, his day of return, where he'll rescue his people,
people but then bring judgment on the planet will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So we know, we know that the, Jesus speaks of the, the, his return and will be associated like a thief in the night. You're not prepared when the thief comes in through your window. It, it's something you're, you don't prepare for, you're not prepared for and it's shocking and it's, it's a surprise and that's the imagery is it? he's saying for most people, Jesus' return will be a shock and a surprise that they're unprepared for. But not God's people. When we think about this final countdown, we're people that understand that the clock has started, the countdown has begun. And so the call for us is to live in light of that. I just think about the volcano Pompeii at Mount Vesuvia in 79 AD that went off. So many of us have studied that in our classes or history that, and how that volcano went off and, and how it entombed and encased this wall of lava and smoke came out and, and hit these two cities, one of them being Pompeii. And we have examples of those who are actually entombed by this intense heat. And I think about how that judgment was so sudden and so horrific. And when the Lord comes back, it, it's gonna have that effect in most people's lives. It'll be, become an, an absolute horror that'll be undo most people. And, and there's, it's too late by then. It's too late. The call to then, is, as it is for us today, is to call people to repent. The Lord is not slow about his promises, but patient, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. That third objection is that Jesus' return ain't thought about. It's irrelevant. Uh, by the way, I, I, I do have some understanding of grammar. It's, I, I wanted to make a point, is that e even as I distort the grammar here, the, the point is this, is that people are not thinking. They're not really thinking about these things. And so the, as a result, even as to distort the grammar, is that it, it, ain't, it ain't thought about, it's irrelevant, but we live kind of that way, regardless if we have advanced degrees after our last names, and we, but the, re, the issue is that often we live almost in, in a stupor, almost as, as if we're, we're, we're nullifying the, the reality of all that we should know about as believers. I, the challenge for me often in my life is, hey Tom, live as if the Lord is coming back. Live in light of his return. And then the question I ask myself is, how do I wish I had lived 300 years from now, this week, this moment, how do I wish I had actually lived the choices I made, the time I invested, the, the resources that God has called me to steward, my time, talents, and treasure, the, my finances, how do I wish I had lived? And so that's where my call for, for myself this morning as well as for each of you is this, the final countdown is on, let's live in light of it. Ready or not, he's coming. The day will come when we will look back at this moment in response to this, how did I wish I had so lived? Because this is what the Peter is inspired to write as he draws the application there, starting in verse 11. He says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Again, there's some phrases and words that are repeated for emphasis you see in the passage. Is that It's a response. This is of absolute relevance for God's people. Absolute relevance. And therefore, he's saying, in light of this, we should live differently. In light of the Lord's return. Again, notice in the passage, he says, what, ought, what kind of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for? So there's this holy conduct. There's this impact on how I live that, that impacts my character. And then also this expectancy, this gaze, this future gaze that reverses back to today to say, okay, then how should I so live? To borrow from the, a title of Francis Schaeffer's books, is like, how should I so live? Is that we should be people that live in light of the Lord's return. 
And so would you join me in this journey as, as ones who over the next few weeks will prayerfully give consideration and as Randy opens the word next week, and Lord, what does this really mean for me today where I am? What, what, what difference should this make on how I live? And in the reality of all of us fall short, that, that's the understanding the grace of God that all of us are at best desperados. Isn't that true? I mean, the reality is, is that all of us need the grace of God applied to our lives, not simply at salvation, but every single day. That he bore my sins, he canceled my debt, and I stand before a holy God completely accepted in the beloved because of Christ. And because of his spirit inside of me, I am empowered now to live in light of his return. And some of those crazy Christians, right? Those people that live so differently that it should affect our standard of living. It should affect our time. It should affect everything about us when we, we know the outcome. We know the final chapter. And he wins, right? He, he's coming back. And so as believers, as God's children, those of us who genuinely are born again, who genuinely have come to know him, is that we can live in light of the Lord's return as forgiven choice, beloved people of God who now live in light of the master's return that affects Monday morning, 8 a.m., affects every single thing about us. And so we, we have this expectant gaze, this, this looking toward the hastening, the, the, the soon arrival, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14 again, therefore, beloved, as God's people, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace spotless and blameless. And I, and I think about what is it about the peace? And I think this is important to qualify. I don't think it's talking about peace in terms of trials. Now, especially as you understand what's going on in the first century here. He's not talking about an absence of trials, but he's talking about actually a clarity of mind. That you should have this clarity of mind, this peace of mind that understands what's going on. It's not caught up in the headlines and nervous Nellies and Neds, and, but it's one who understands what God is doing and there's this stability and this confidence and this intentionality about our lives because we serve the great master who's coming back, who's gonna bring a culmination as the victor of all as he establishes the new heaven and the new earth. And so he said, therefore, again, this emphasis that we would live lives in response that are spotless and blameless. And regarding the patience of our Lord as salvation, in other words, is that, again, this all in the context of the Great Commission and the, the great mandate of God is that we go make disciples. This is all seen in light of the great story, God's great story that is unfolding for all of us. Those of us who are part of that have been born again, as we know, we we're about taking the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, starting with our neighborhoods, our families, and then being part of his great story as he culminates that all at the end. And for those who refuse to bend the knee, judgment awaits them. And for those of us who, have, in his mercy and grace, who have come to know the Lord, then salvation and what we were to live out, what we were created for from the very beginning of time in the new heaven and the new earth. And so what are we called to be in light of that? You know, Jesus is, is relevant. He's the utmost rele relevant event, coming, his coming back. And so I would submit to you is that we are to be gracious disruptors in our world. Disruptors in that we have to enter into our world knowing that it can't be the status quo. It just can't be the same way all the time. We have to think about that in our families, for our loved ones. And, and I know if you're like me, I, I, I was... Of the, I was the one of five boys, five males in our family, and I was the first believer of the five, my, my five brothers. Actually, four other brothers, I'm the fifth. So with that is, I, you know, I've talked to him about the Lord. It, it is challenging, to say the least. Um, for those of you who know a little bit of my story, is that a, a lot of turbulence, a lot of uh, anger, Volatility, uh, sorrow, yelling, tears, threats, all of that accompany just within my immediate family. And you expand that to my fraternity at, on campus. And all, you keep working out from that. And, and, and as a, when I took a job in Mission Hills out of college, at Purdue, from out, of, out of school from Purdue in business, and, and trying to reach out to the guys I, I worked with in the marketplace, and understanding I became a, a disruptor, and I had to learn to be a gracious disruptor. You know what I'm talking about? 
where I wasn't just brash and, you know, and, but I had to grow in wisdom. When we understand that the Lord's coming back, we should be ones that are gracious disruptors in our world. If not, then, then we're waving as loved ones and people around us that God has sovereignly placed in our world. We're just kind of waving them as they go down to the, the, the river of destruction. And so God calls us to be these kind of people that are humble. See, it's not enough to be theologically sound and orthodoxically asleep. It's not enough. That doesn't mean anything. We have to be people that, that are, are compelled by our orthodoxy, by our theology, to a passionate pursuit of those around us. If not, it's just creedal knowledge. It's, it, you really don't believe what we say we believe. And so we need to be people, though, as I think about that and I go into my world and my family, most of which my brothers still don't know Christ, as I interact with them, I have to be mindful. Oh, yeah, that's right. The Lord's coming back. I know we've talked about this over the last 38 years, but, you know, it's still on the table. One has come to Christ by his God's mercy, but there's still a couple of others who still have yet to bend their knee. And so where does God have you? What difference should this make in our lives? And let me submit to you again, it, it should have this awakened intentionality about it. Because I don't think I'm the only one here that deals with this kind of sometimes the surreal existence that lives my life as if I, I really don't believe Jesus is coming back. But if I think about it and, and I meditate on it, I go, oh yeah. Oh yeah, he's coming back. And then it, what it should lead within me, this awakened intentionality, this purposefulness about my life. People should see a difference in that. I was recently having the opportunity to talk to a friend of mine about this, and I, I thought, you know, it would be great to kind of pull him in this discussion with me. So I'm gonna invite Dean Liddell up. Would you guys welcome our, our brother Dean from our body? Come on up, Dean. <laughs> And um, uh, here's the mic here. Let me get this one here. And, uh, and so with that is I'm, um, it's one of those tragic things that you're supposed to check the mics before you, you know, you grab them to make sure you turn them on correctly. Um, Steve, is this, it's on, good. Okay, there we go. So with that, um, I, I, I invited Dean up here to join me. Um, and, and the reason is we've had a chance to get to know each other. Um, and Dean is a, He's a father of uh, two adults, um, children, and a business owner, and um, an entrepreneur. And I, as we were talking about this, we were talking about like, what difference should this really make? And I thought, well, hey, let's let some people eavesdrop into our conversation. So thanks for joining me. You got it. Yeah, Thank all you. right. Yeah. So Dean, when, um, as you, <clears throat> one of the things we're talking about is there are obstacles. When we, when we think about applying this and living the reality of this out, that the Lord's return, and how, what difference should it make in our lives? There are obstacles that, that we, adore, we, we deal with that are real. What are some of the obstacles you feel like in your demographic, your stage of life, that, that keep you from going, you know what, I, I'm not really living out the reality of Jesus' return as I ought to. What are some obstacles to that, do you think? Well, I think, um, can, is, is this okay? Perfect, yeah. yeah. I think for me, um, Tom, and we've talked about this quite a bit, is that, um, you know, I struggle day to day with the old self and the new self and being a new believer um you know i'm constantly challenged i'm constantly in the word i'm trying to apply the word but i'm seeing on a day to day on an hourly basis the the old self that um was really not a very pleasant not a very happy not a saved person not a christian and um so i think that's you know one of the obstacles that I see personally and that I struggle with and yeah. and as I apply uh, my new beliefs um, you know it's a it's a constant battle to try to uh, stay the course and stay in the word and and mm -hmm. and stay mm -hmm. stay believing can I ask you with that Dean as you look back um, and, and I've some of you had an opportunity to see hear Dean's testimony a couple months ago um, up front and and you were a church grower, grower, in fact, here, right at the bridge for a yep, number of yep, years. Sure and then four or five years ago, God got hold of your heart where mm -hmm. you feel like you were really born again. As you look back on that period of time when you were going to church, but not truly born again, not truly saved, um, the whole t if the topic of 
Jesus' return came up, what would you think of that? I mean, what would come to your mind? It would be like, I mean, what did you do with that during that period of time? It's probably here at the bridge. You, you heard it more than once, my guess. Yeah. But what was that like for you during that period yeah, of time? I think, I think for me, I think it was impactful while I was in service or while I was, uh, you know, at lunch with Pastor Paul or, you know, it, would, it was meaningful. It, it, it was believable. It was meaningful. But the minute, you know, I left the church grounds or the breakfast with Paul or whatever it was, it, it had no, no transition or no evolution into my day-to-day life. And, mm-hmm. you know, you mentioned Monday morning, which is, you know, part of it, for, especially for somebody who spends a lot of time at work and in their business. You know, there was just no application and there was no, there was no transition or no bridge between the reality, which I believed to be true. I just didn't fully understand how to apply that in my in my life and Mm -hmm. it was through tools I learned through hours and hours and hours of commitment from my friend Mike Voss who spent Mm -hmm. um, months and years I think and we still spend time together giving me tools giving me scripture Mm -hmm. and it was very small bites it was verses on index cards apply this this week Dean Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, read these three times or 10 times or 30 times a day and apply this to how you're dealing with your staff or dealing with your, your business dealings. And those things were very impactful to just very slowly changing, I, I guess maybe very quickly relative to the scope of my entire life, Tom. But um, it was just tools like this that, you know, that, that, that really were impactful to making the transition or applying. So, so let me just see if I got you on that too. Is as, you know, here you are on your journey, um, you, you come to faith in Christ, and even during that period of time, and, and maybe even, now if I understand your, your story correctly, it's even actually before that, there are other individuals in your life that invested time into you around the scriptures that gave, was fertile soil, as it were, that was over time began to take root in your life so that you began to, in a sense, be awakened, right? right? And, and then, now, as a business owner, I think a lot of us can understand a busy week, what that like for most of us here, uh, whether as young people, as students who are trying to get the grade or, and trying to keep their job, and, or whether as people that have been in the professional marketplace for years, is uh, what, what do you feel like are some helpful thoughts? Because it can be consuming. I mean, our jobs are demanding, our minds are here, I've got, or for younger people, they're studying this. I'm not studying in times all the time, right? And so what are some practical thoughts that were helpful for you in that journey to more of an awakened intentionality about your life? And I know we're all in the journey. We're all in the process right. here. None of us arrived here. But what would be some things that you found were helpful that we could even think, okay, that's good. I, I can walk away with this action step. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think a lot of it, just to kind of back up a little bit, Tom, is that, you know, for me it was, there's two types of practicality. There's the practicality of my old self, which was very financially driven, very resource driven. Um, And then there was my changed heart. And frankly, you know, there was moments um, where I think in my initial conversations with Mike Voss, uh, in fact, our initial meeting together, he said to me, um, okay, why are you here? I didn't know. And he said, well, I I think we're going to work on changing your heart. And I was, well, my heart's fine. Yeah. You know, I give, I help, I'm kind, I, uh, I'm doing my share, you know, and I've got a, I've got a big heart and I, I and I was known for that. Um, you know, we all hear it. And, but, um, Mike said, no, no, no here. And he showed me through a diagram. Here's your heart. And there was a black heart. I thought that's not me. And yeah, yeah. by the end of our first time together, I was like, oh, that's me. That's me on steroids. I mean, I am nowhere near. And so we worked on the transition of my heart. And the reason I wanted to say that, it kind of in a long answer to your question, is that it changed my perspective on how I look at practicality and how I look at my entire being, my entire world, my family, my children, my wife, uh, uh, our staff, uh, my employees, my business partners, everything else. And it's, it was a different lens. You know, and, and mm-hmm. in, in applying practicality, I stopped looking at my wife just as a partner that I was enduring a 40-year relationship. I started looking at her as 
somebody who is enriching my life every single minute and thankful for her every minute. And I am thankful for her every minute. Mm -hmm. I looked at my children the same way. They're not just children that I'm obligated to bring up and keep safe and feed and things like that. They were, they were enriching my life at every minute. And especially um, with the influence that they had on me because they were both very active in the church and they were both uh, 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 Christians and, and followers. And my son in particular was, was very vocal about about where I stood. So, apologize for the long answer, but no. um, it, it, it changed how I looked at everything in my life. I started to look at business partners as, as true brothers and, and, and true sisters and true people that I could affect their life, not just make money from. I looked mm -hmm. at employees as human beings, as, as, as people that, that had problems and had obstacles and maybe didn't have faith or didn't have family or didn't have financial stability. And instead of just resources that when I was done with them were discarded, which is, you know, as a good business person, you know, you're, you're, you're taught once the asset has, has realized its, its, um, its financial gain, then it's no longer part of the business. And the good business decision is, is to part ways. But I started to look mm -hmm. at that very differently. So everything in my entire world became um, guided by practical decisions that were from this new heart, this this born again heart, and it it just changed changed everything for me. You Very know? cool. And so, yeah. Thank you. One last question um, is: you mentioned about your you're working with younger people, and you have a new business that you've started, um, and it employs many millennials, mm -hmm. younger generations. Um, of that younger generation, how, uh, when you think about the Lord's return, and then even as your, if you've interacted with a lot of these up and coming leaders and influencers and marketplace and, and beyond, is when you think about the Lord's return, what do you think is some of the greater obstacles for that younger demographic? You know, you've got these young emerging influencers, cultural mm -hmm. influencers, leaders, marketplace leaders. Um, you get front and center to that, mm -hmm. and if I might understand. And so, any thoughts on how that First of all, what would be maybe some specific obstacles for that age group, mm -hmm. 35 under age group? And then also, secondarily, is what are some ways as older believers that love Christ, how we can be an influence, a positive influence in helping that younger group? Because even as we look ahead as a church, we're, we're going to be going through a younging. That's, I think it, I've made up the word. Um, and and that's, that's going to be part of it as we see younger men and women come into the body and the importance of that. And so with that, would you comment in light of your unique perspective and, and that in the marketplace? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, again, my personal perspective and experience has been that this younger generation are, are there's two main areas that they're lacking. One is, is uh, an influence, a positive influence at home, the family. And I, I know for a fact that I consider myself a great family provider. Yeah. Um, I was not a Christian family leader. We were a Christian household, I mentioned during my testimony some months ago. Um, but I was a, a horrible family leader, terrible family leader. And though I believed, I prided myself, I provided everything that, according to the book, tells you, I don't mean our book, I mean Society's yeah, society's book that you know it's a great leader. He provides everything. He buys his kids cars. He does everything else. And I believe that as I talk to a lot of younger kids, I don't believe they've got um, any family influence at all, and certainly not a godly influence at home. Um, there's no spiritual guidance. There's no spiritual leadership. Um, and so that's you know that's something that I I see a lot of problems with the youth that we deal with. They're just lacking that influence at home. And they come from, you know, they wouldn't considered, or they wouldn't be coming from what's considered a battered or a beaten home or anything like that. But they're just coming from homes where there's absolutely no spiritual leadership whatsoever. Secondly, I think in society, including um, uh, their business leaders, they're, uh, they're being led by a very misguided um, standard, which is driven by uh, materialistic and influencer followers and you know all this other all this other stuff and as business leaders I've, I've taken the responsibility to provide a different influence and I, I, I wouldn't say that you walk into our businesses 
and we're continually talking about Scripture and talking about God, but, but we provide a, a very different form of leadership, and that is my responsibility. My, my loving wife reminds me of that all the time. Mm-hmm. When I get knocked off course a little bit, she's like, these are, you know, I'll come home to her and say I spent a couple hours sitting with somebody and I'm frustrated because I got other things to do or it extended my work day. And she, Patty will say to me all the time, she'll say, that's your privilege. Mm-hmm. And I'll be reminded really quickly, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, that that is my privilege. So to provide leadership out, you know, in, in the, whether it's the work environment or out there in society is, and these young kids are lacking it. You know, what they think is important is, is really off track. And, you know, to kind of what you're talking about today with, um, with what we're all facing sometime soon, being saved is, is, you know, I look at these young kids and I think, you've got to get saved. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, this is, you are off track. Everything about you from home to work to what's important to you is is completely off track and you know i'll say this though that the good news for these kids is that they're 25 26 23 28 years old i was 50 years old and was more lost than they are you know what was important to me was completely misguided and i was saved at 53 or 54 years old i mean and if there's hope for somebody like me, there's hope for these young kids. We, they just need more leaders and more Christian leaders. And, you. you know, those are hard to find, as I'm realizing. Well, you know, I, I happen to know where there's a bunch of them. Um, <laughs> uh, I happen to know exactly where they are this morning, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Interesting enough. Yeah. Um, so, um, Dean, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you thank so you. much for that. Can we thank link you. Dean for that? It's time. Thank you, brother. It, is, is when we think about the Lord's return, there's only so many things that ultimately matter. And it gets back to that awakened intentionality that, that we would be those people in each of our worlds that say, God, by your grace, Lord, because of your gracious work in my heart, let me be awakened to what matters most. And Lord, and maybe it just starts with a simple prayer to say, Lord, I don't even know what the, where to this begins in my world, but Lord, you do. So Lord, even as, as Randy continues to open the word and things get very specific in next couple of weeks, is that Lord, let me grab hold of that and let that compel me to understand what's the action step for me? What is the next step in my world? What is the one action step I can take today to, to be awakened to an intentional, purposeful life that lives out of the Lord's return? And I'm gonna ask us to do this. Is, is in, We're gonna be singing the last song in a moment, but now it's gonna be your turn. I'm just gonna ask you to take two minutes. I'm gonna ask you to just take a two minutes and start with just asking the Lord in just quietness of your own heart. Say, Lord, what is one action step you want me to take today? In light of the Lord's return, that is, it's happening, it's, it's on its way, it's certain. Lord, what is one action step that you would have me take today? I want you to just think about that for a minute, and then I'm gonna ask you to turn to someone near you, maybe someone that you're sitting next to, and I want you to share whatever that is before I, we have an opportunity to close in prayer and, and, and sing. So would you do that? Would you just, I wanna invite you to just take a moment. I, I know I, I might be, be on my pay grade here, you know, and um, so let, but I, I'm gonna ask you to just take a moment, uh, first for about 30 or 40 seconds, like, where does this impact my life? I know it might be a little bit unusual for a Sunday morning, but I, again, I want to encourage you to do this as doers of the word, not merely hearers. And I want to ask you to turn to the person next to you, someone near you, and say, uh, this is one thing I think God has put on my heart, and I'm, I'm a transition in prayer. So go ahead and let's take a moment and do that.
would you take a moment and turn to someone near you and share what's that one action step? Go ahead and do that. One more minute, let's just take one more minute, please. All right, let me, let me draw your attention back as you as we go into our last song, concluding song, as we respond in worship to the message, there are some of you here that maybe by God's grace and mercy, you realize for the first time, you're in the outside looking in and you have yet to be born again. You know, let today be the day of salvation, scripture says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. For others of you, I, I, there are certain things that God has put on your heart that are, are pressing. And, and I'm just gonna ask, if, just for a moment, if, if all of the life group leaders and staff and their spouses would stand, all I'm gonna have to do is just stand and sit back down. I just wanna make sure everybody knows who you are. So if you're on all the elders, staff, and then deaconesses and deacons, would you all stand? Would you all just stand just for a moment, life group leaders as well? If you're here and you go, I, I would love to talk to somebody and, and you're a young woman here, there's a bunch of ladies that would love to be able to pray with you and minister to you this morning before you leave. And also for the men that are here, or a couple, you're going through it and you're going, man, we, we, just, we just had a terrible time over here and we barely made it and I think I got cussed out if I'm not sure. I mean, so you're going like, I need someone to pray with, with us. You're in the right place. These people will minister to you. Just spot one of them and just say, hey, can I just talk to you for a minute? You can all, let's everybody else stand together. Let's close together, Steve. 